Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you? Today's episode is a vulnerable one. I get a little tearful. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I always want to give you a heads up. I am having some really young beliefs that are going on in I sent a video to Jen this morning before we recorded and she didn't have a chance to listen to it. So when we connected, I said, let's just talk about this on the episode. So we talked about this belief that is coming up for me just today that said, if people really loved me, then they would know intuitively what I need and I wouldn't have to ask for it and they would show up and give me what I need. Now, (laughs) is that realistic and reasonable? Of course not. But that is what's up for me today. And I got a little tearful about it. I share some context about why it's coming up. We also talk about relationships and an insight that I had. I think that it's very common for many of us to assume that everybody else has their stuff together. And when we bump up against challenges and relationships, it's us and it's not the other person has limitations or maybe other people also struggle and don't have their stuff together. And we talk about not being included in something and how do you navigate that? How do you turn that around so that you have a sense of empowerment because there was something that I wasn't included in and I had to work through that. I think this episode has some really just beautiful nuggets, honesty, truths. I think it's a great episode. I wish I was able to give you a little bit more information. One of the notes that I wrote down is Jen talked about using the term, am I a vibrational match with somebody? And for me, it's like, do I choose you? Do you choose me? And really focusing on that because it's so easy to circle the drain when those wounded parts come up. And then we want to pull everything from our history that validates that confirmation bias. It validates why we don't fit in, why we don't belong, why we're not enough, why we're too much. And I also talk about this thing that I do in relationship. And I talked about how it shows up with Jen and how it ends up hurting me. So. I think it's a great episode. And if you like hearing kayak stuff, there's a little bit of kayak wins for me at the end. And if you don't like it, I give you a heads up so you don't have to listen. I think that's it. And now on to the show. Hey, Jen, how are you? Hi, Patricia. I'm okay. Oh, it's nice to be with you. Nice to be with you too. You've had a busy day already. Yeah, I love how grounding you are for me though. It's like it feels... It feels nice. It feels nice to be here. Mm. How are you, my dear? Oh, I'm feeling tearful. Mm. So I think I'm just going to let it be okay to go there. Absolutely. I got you. Thanks. I've been in a really good spot for a couple of weeks. And I don't know what happened. I woke up this morning and it just feels like old stuff. And the theme is this belief that If people loved me, they would know what I want and they would do it and I wouldn't have to ask for it. And I recognize that that's a very young part, that that is not as amazing that would be if that were possible. (laughs) That's just not realistic. But that's really the core of what's going on. And so I spent some time doing some parts work this morning. I had a good cry. I reached out to you. I left a video message for you. I was concerned I was going to delete it and I didn't. But what I also recognized is I don't think that I let you know how hard things were. And when I get in this place, there's something that happens that I don't like having needs. I don't like asking for help. I want people to know what I want. I don't want to have to tell them. And like, it makes me really angry that people can't intuitively know what I need and give it to me. It's a very young, very disempowered place, very disempowered. And I'm just trying to be with that part and to let her know that that's okay, that that's how she feels and to not go into making up stories around that. And I think that's the part that feels challenging for me is to just let it be okay to be in the moment and to have it be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you didn't delete your polo. And I'm glad that we have this dialogue 
about these things because it can feel so true. And we want to validate that. And then we want to, yeah, just keep working with it. It's so beautiful. And it is okay. And it, it's all okay. Even the spinning out in the story about it, because that's what humans do. We all do it. So even that's okay. I, I like to think that just knowing that you're doing it, it's like the blessing, mm -hmm. right? And being able to watch even because it's calling out, right? It's calling out for some attention. Yeah. And you're doing that. You're asking for it from me and then you're giving it to yourself. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I know you haven't had a chance to listen to the second polo, but even in that second polo, I'm like, and I don't want you to ask how you can support me. I don't want to do the work. I don't want to do the labor. But that's part of what's coming up and allowing that, that just young part that just feels really like mad that people weren't attuned to her and that she didn't get what she needed when I was younger. Yeah. Finding a way to be present for that part of the context around this. And it's relevant and it's not, is that my birthday's coming up and you offered to help plan it. My mom has given me, she's been incredibly generous and given me money to, ha you know, I, I'm having four people and my mom doing something very, very, very small and intimate for my birthday. And initially I wanted to do something big because I'm turning 60. And then I learned I was autistic and didn't want to do anything because everything felt like too much. And then I kind of came back to, I, I want to do something very small and intimate. And I honestly thought that I was good with all of the planning and everything that I was doing. It's like up until this morning, I felt really good about everything that was going on. And then this morning, like I'm a different person and feeling burdened by things and feeling frustrated and in allowing myself to have the feelings that I was having, some of the things that I was having fantasies of like, I just wish somebody else would do this. Like I sat down and did it and it it was fine doing it. I didn't do it with like, eh, here, I have to do all this stuff and how come other people aren't doing it? And how come, you know, it was just like, oh, why don't I just sit down and see what I can find out? So it's a really interesting process. And I know that historically that when I've gotten in this place and I haven't been able to chaperone that young part, this is where I have ruptures in relationships because that young part takes over and I try and get people to show up the way that that young part wants them to. And if it's coming from that young part, that is not very helpful for a successful longevity in adult relationships. If it's coming from my adult saying, this is what's going on. I know that this isn't realistic, but this is what my fantasy is. Can we talk about it? That's okay. There's nothing wrong with this young part, but just it's hard. Mm, it is hard. Yeah. I remember when I first dove into the parts work, walking in on my friend, my friend Michael, who was also, we were in training together and we would, after the training, we did a lot of work together, both to learn it and then to do our own exploring. And I remember walking in and asking him, like, am I congruent? <laughs> because you can feel like such a different person depending on which part you're the most blended with and then your mm -hmm. awareness of those parts. So that really young part feels very different from your tasky part that I love so much. I love all your parts, <laughs> but the tasky one, the manager comes in and sits down and gets stuff done. And then there's this presence, right? That's the chaperone is that self presence. And it's just thinking like maybe one of the reasons why I have so much space for that young part for you is because I know my own work with that very, very young part. And just, mm -hmm. I mean, if you imagine an infant that's not getting its needs met all the time because, and I'm a, you know, I'm a mom, I mean, you can't always as much as well intended as you are. And that the rawness with which she can howl mm -hmm. and the depth of feeling is very arresting. And if you've ever heard a baby cry, I mean, whew, that's it, right? And having that presencing, being able to go over to her. And I have a visual that I use now where it's like, I'm picking her up, I'm rocking her, I'm smelling her head. I'm like, just trying to hold space for this. And this is part of the beauty of doing your own work and then doing work together. Mm -hmm. It's not like she goes away. Like that's, it's my history. It's my story. It's, it's part of my tropes. It's my schema, like whatever name you want to throw at it. It's in my memory network. <laughs> it gets triggered. It's, there's so many ways in to do this work. So she's, so she's here. She's a part mm -hmm. of me for good. Yeah. And then being able to have compassion for each other's parts. 
So that baby's like almost never satisfied, really. That really young part. Mm-mm. Yeah. It's just about yeah. holding. It's interesting. The part of me that always wants to figure things out, which is a part I love, can be incredibly tenacious. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and there may be no rhyme or reason, but I'm just so curious that it feels like this came out of nowhere. There, that may not be true. And I have an inkling that this started yesterday when a friend of mine was sending me some links and some suggestions because I was telling her about what I wanted. And I, I have a feeling that what that may have activated for me and I didn't make the connection till now. It's like, don't you want to do it for me? Like, why do I? It's my birthday. Why don't you do it? And this is not her responsibility. I want to be very clear that, again, I have this fantasy and really how I operate in most of my life is I'm a great idea person. But if I had people behind me to put into action all of my ideas, my life would be so smooth and easy because I can be clear sometimes about what the idea is, but actually doing it and following through is a little bit harder for me. Oh, I feel that totally. (laughs) Yes. Everybody raise their hand who can relate. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Especially if you have challenges with planning and organizing and executive function and Mm -hmm. managing time and tasks and getting bogged down in the details and not, I have a tendency to overcomplicate things because my tendency to go from the details from the bottom up as opposed to seeing what the big picture is. So it's just interesting to me. And what I have to say in the same breath is I've had some incredibly empowering and exhilarating experiences that I want to talk about and some challenges. And you and I were just talking the other day. I don't think I can articulate this very well. And when we were talking about it, it still felt very rough and bumpy. But I had something happen recently where I do this thing with these people. (laughs) Going to be as big as I can be. (laughs) And I haven't been going for a little bit. And in this group, it's not really, they don't have a deep appreciation for who I am. And it's not a great fit for me, but the activity is something that I enjoy, which is why I continue to to go to this group. But somebody from this group talked to a friend of mine to see if my friend was going to the group, but didn't talk to me about it. And, you know, my friend had mentioned it to me. I talked to you about this the day that it happened and it brought up that part of like, how come I'm not picked and feeling hurt and feeling angry. And what I came to is like, do I choose the people in this group? No, I don't. I like the activity, but those are not my people, nor am I their people. I'm just not because of history, because of how I'm wired, because of lots of things. And for you, the listener, that there may be activities that you really enjoy doing and you participate with groups or things that you like learning or studying or going to places that you may do these activities with people that are not necessarily your people. We're not talking about abusive. We're not talking about anything that's a terrible thing. But these are not people who know your heart, that get you, that understand you, that honor you, where you feel at home. But it's worth it because you want to travel or you want to go to a museum or there's an activity that you like doing or you like going to a certain theater or anything like that. That those are choices that we make. And I've really been using this mantra of who do I choose and who chooses me and really using that to empower myself because it is easy to go into a very disempowered place of how come they didn't talk to me about and the fact that they didn't say anything to me doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not invited or not included and going back to that place of being empowered about I don't really choose them and they don't choose me and that's okay and getting to a place in my life where I would love to have this concept of I'm constantly kind and thoughtful and everybody knows what integrity I have and I'm seen as this stellar person and that is not really the reality especially this last year I've had I've had some hiccups and bumps with people I've had to set boundaries I've had to be really firm with some people I've had to make a choice or I've made a choice to not respond to certain people I've made a choice to respond to other people and if you talk to those people about who I am you will get a very different perspective than how I show up here on the podcast. And I'm okay with that. And I Mm -hmm. think sometimes we have this investment in wanting to feel like we're these beautiful, perfect, kind, loving people. And it's okay that not everybody likes me. It's okay that not everybody gets me. It's okay that some people think that I'm not being responsive or giving them information when I'm clear that I've given them what I have to give or that I'm going to talk about things that are important for me to talk about if it makes them unhappy. Like I have a right to show up fully being me and 
Not everybody's going to like that or get that. That's a very empowering place to come from, especially if you're wired to want people to like you, to want to make peace, to not have conflict. That's really a huge concept. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Everything you just said. It's funny. I've had some of my own bumps this year and having to do things that don't fit my self-concept. Well, usually it's boundary related. And Mm -hmm. one thing that I had recently kind of show up for me, you know, we're, we're in this framework of like, I don't know, kind of like good and bad. And somehow that feels so problematic. And the phrase that I've been using is like, it's not a vibrational match in the moment. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's not resonant. And that doesn't mean one's better than the other or worse, or that it even has to be conflictual. It's just not a vibrational match. I'm not a vibrational match with a lot of things. I mean, we all have our own speeds. Some of us are slower and more contemplative. Some people are very fast and decisive. There's a lot of these things that are just differences between people and to accept those differences. Now, in some of these situations, well, it's been interesting though for me because there are certain boundaries that I've had to put up with people. Again, that's not necessarily all my self-concept. That's de-contextualizing myself, right? In the context, Mm -hmm. it's a thousand percent like what needs to be asserted and what Mm -hmm. needs to happen. And some of it has been very painful with people I love. And it's much safer sometimes for me to love them at a little bit of a distance. So these things are called for. And this idea about being okay, being the villain in someone else's story, right? Or however they choose to tell it. And I am pretty committed to telling the truest most generous and beautiful story about myself and others, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where this has kind of come up. It's like, well, this is just not a vibrational match right now. Or maybe it is in some ways, but then it isn't in others. Mm -hmm. And that there's really a sense of okayness. Like you get to be you, I get to be me. And maybe this is what our paths cross in this one area. And then there's Mm -hmm. other people where my, our paths cross and the vibration matches a lot of the time. And that's right. what I, I, you and I tend to experience a lot. I mean, how many times do we right. text each other and be like, you're the only person I could tell this to? <laughs> right. <laughs> I think I did that yesterday. <laughs> I think I did it this morning, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. And part of that too is when I'm going through this place and I know that with some of the things that have been going on with you too. I I don't know if this goes on with you because I don't hear you talk about it. But I have to remember who I do choose and who chooses me and to focus on that because it's always so easy. Those young wounded parts really want to jump into all the ways that we don't fit in, we don't connect, we don't belong. And to really jump into that narrative, especially like, you know, when I got this information the other day about not being chosen, that I could have really circled the drain and pulled out every experience from my entire life of every time that I didn't fit in and I wasn't chosen and wow, 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 wow. Confirmation bias, right? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. Which is what our brain does to keep us safe and to make sense. Mm -hmm. Or I can really focus on who is here for me, who does get me, who who chooses me, and who do I choose for me people. Yeah. And I think that was the polo I left you, right? (laughs) It's like, I didn't even finish listening to yours. I just hit... You're for me and you're (laughs) right, (laughs) right. And I think that when we have the ability to look at these dark, shadowy parts of ourselves, if you and I didn't do the work that we did, I wouldn't have shared that with you because I would be sure that if I told you that you would be like, of course, they didn't choose you because look at all these things that you do. That shame that many people have, and I had a ton of shame early on and I just continue to work on it. And I know that what works with shame is by talking about it, bringing it out in the light. And I feel so grateful that you and I have, because of the work that we do, I think we so far, it's been four or five years. It's debatable now because Facebook said we've been friends for five years. So I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that we can bring all of our parts to the relationship and that there's not a need to pull back and withhold anything. Doesn't mean I still don't worry about being too much or anything like that, but we bring it to the relationship. And part of what I recognize too, that a pattern that I have is 
I know how busy and full your life is. And sometimes I do this thing where I don't want to bring more to your life because my perception is I'm taking from your life. But the truth is, if I don't ask for it, somebody else is going to take it. (laughs) And this is something that I I do. Right. I mean, this happens where I feel like you have limited time. Yeah. It's pointing to my lack of (laughs) ability with boundaries (laughs) that I'm actively working on. But yeah, no, right. it's just making me chuckle because, you know. It's- yeah, but that I feel like that's currently showing up for me in that I know you're busy and I don't want to add more demand, but but what I do is I don't do it. And then I see you being pulled by all these other things and it's like, well, shoot, that could have, you know, I could have had my need met because my fear of being too much and I think my wanting to take care of you, which is sometimes helpful and sometimes it's really not. Yeah, well, everything's got its pros and cons. I appreciate that. And I'm glad that we talk about it because I do think there's a lot, like you said, with shame, it's like the ability to let the truth of your moment, whatever it may be, like just hit the air and be compassionately witnessed, whether that's with a therapist Mm. or a trusted friend is really so key to helping it transform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been interesting. I have two more recent relationships in my life that I'm feeling very connected to and really wanting to nurture these relationships. These women are younger than I am and you're 10 years younger than I am and I don't think about age and relationships, but I see a lot of my younger parts in them and areas where I had a hard time showing up and felt like too much and just held back and I was sharing with them. It it made me feel like it It didn't sound the way I wanted it to, but I think that they understood the intention is the gifts of healing that I've gotten in my relationship with you have been so powerful, so powerful. I don't think I've ever been able to do the amount of healing in a relationship with somebody that you and I have done, and we're just a really good fit for each other. And what I shared is I would like to be able to be that person for them that I can show up and be solid and help them do some of the healing because this is what the goal of a I really think of healthy relationships, of therapy, of coaching, is you have somebody who's got the skills and can hold space that you can, like today, you know, I can be in my disempowered place, but it's not activating anything for you and you can show up as a loving presence for me so that I can do healing work there. And I want to be able to share that with, can't do it with everybody, but with clients, it's very important for me to do that. And in these two newer relationships, I would really like to be able to be there for them in the way that you've been there for me. Mm. We pay it forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. As you were talking, I was thinking about how important it is that when we're kind of blended with this part, that the person holding space for us also knows like our fullness, you know, like knows in some ways, like kind of who we really are. Because mm-hmm. when we're blended with a part, it's only well, a part of who we are. <laughs> mm hmm. There was a really pretty saying, I'm going to botch it right now, but it's like that friend is someone who can sing your song back to you and you've forgotten it. Mm -hmm. (sighs) This gift of being able to not make someone else's struggle about us and to not like, mm-hmm. jump into that just to be able to stand back stay curious not furious or not like hooked into it and there's a couple of things related to that that I've heard recently that just really resonated and one was if you really could see the degree to which every human being is projecting right we're all socially constructed in each other's heads and we're projecting what we see like you would never take anything personally again mm-hmm. And then the other one, and this one really got me, was once you understand that every criticism is actually a confession. And it's more than just like considering the the source, it's being able to be like, hey, we're all human. One of the very natural states of being human is to be bewildered (laughs) and Mm -hmm. only be able to see one point of view instead of multiple points of view, even like your own parts, different points of view, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's funny how it's kind of like a little holograph, right? And yeah, just to be able to have that kind of spaciousness. And that's where when I'm working with people or when I'm working with myself, I really tune into if it's causing tension, 
like question it, like get curious. And if it's mm. open or you get a sensation of opening to whatever is true in the moment, usually you're not wrapped tightly in a story. And mm -hmm. believe me, I was one of the most tightly wound people. It's hard one, but it's I found that it's very worth the effort. That tension is to me like kind of like a somatic indicator of where I'm at and how I'm able if I'm if I'm really able to be present. And I have lately taken to, I'm not sure I would suggest this. I guess it all depends. But when I know that I'm tight, I'm getting tight. And sometimes that's for me, it might be premenstrual or it may be a degree of stress that I'm going through or how many demands are on me. Like I will kind of make that known and just be like, you know, time out for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or my daughter and I have this thing. We, she has this pin. It just says cranky B. <laughs> That's a full word, right? Cranky itch. And we'll wear it as like, a, hey, just letting you know, you know, because it's, a, you know, we're not going to therapy our way out of being human. Is how do we work right. with ourselves and everybody else? I think it's helpful when we let people know that we're on a limited capacity because nobody's going to know. If I don't tell people I'm on my last thread, I'm tired, I don't have a lot to give, and then they approach me and I don't respond the way that they expect, then they're going to wonder, they're either going to make it about them or they're going to make it about me. And it's really interesting. I'm glad you brought this up. I had the most, it's such a simple revelation of why it took me this long to get it. I think that many of us do this in relationships that we tend to think that we're the problem and we really lack the, I don't know what the word is, the verb, but we don't see how much humanity there is in the people that we're in relationships with. And what this looks like is there's a specific relationship that I've had for quite some time that is very, very complicated. And I just always assumed that this person had their stuff together. Why I did that, I don't know. That just was my assumption. And so I only saw the challenges that we had or what my limitations were. I would start to see their limitations, but I had this epiphany that this person is human and has lots of fallibilities and lots of things in their life that are human, very human, and does not have their stuff together in the way that I, I don't know why I assume they did or why I projected that, I don't know. And there was something in me that just went like, <sighs> Yeah, that's important what you're bringing up, right? Because shame hangs out when there's shame when there's perfectionism, right? And perfectionism is mm -hmm. a myth. And we know that we fail <laughs> because we can't because it's a myth to reach whatever that what it looks like to have all your stuff together. Mm -hmm. But then we project that ideal, assuming that everybody else does. And we're just the wackadoos that are doing it wrong. Right. And so I, I think those things, while they're it's kind of like a mirror image of each other, like the degree to which mm -hmm. we're hiding kind of under this like, oh, God, I'm really not doing it, you know, not having it together because you can't. It will project that. That's There it is. Like there's your projection, you know. Right. So, yeah, it's really interesting. And when we bump up against limitations in relationships, either people don't show up as frequently as we want or the way that we want or we share things and they don't get it or it rubs them the wrong way, we often feel like there's something wrong with us or we look at that person in that moment and may see a limitation but don't see the larger pattern. And I'm, I'm not doing a better than, worse than. But how I would reframe this whole relationship now is I show up authentically and talk about what's going on and my capacity to be pretty vulnerable and to do a lot of risking in relationships is very, very high compared to this relationship. And I just kept thinking what's wrong with me. And some of some comments that I'd gotten about my relationships made me feel some shame as opposed to I really do a lot of risking in friendships and relationships. And that means that sometimes relationships are here for a little while. They're there for a long time. They work, they don't work. And there's nothing wrong with that. I would much rather continue to practice and try relationships than have very few or none in my life because I have to do it perfectly. I love that. That's really inspiring, especially because I tend to go a little aloof and I would love to enrich more of my mm -hmm. relationships. And I was thinking too, while you were talking, like there are some people that we're very close to mm -hmm. and then there's other people that maybe we don't overlap quite so much, but that yeah. doesn't mean that they're not in our constellation, right? Of friends. Yeah. They just may not be yeah. quite as close to the inner circle, right? And that you can still enjoy 
those relationships and those friendships. That's funny as you were talking, especially this part about wondering, like, why did I do that? Like, why did I assume this person had all their stuff together? It, I had this little flash in my mind about what is a, a human journey, right? That mm-hmm. almost all of us share is that from being a child and being taken care of by someone that you may inherently just assume has it all together. And, you know, there are some parents out there who will maintain that and never let you see, probably because of shame, right? Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, because that's where we, that's kind of where we start and realizing that our parents are not perfect. And the game was sort of always rigged (laughs) Mm -hmm. for us to have some kind of seed of some sort of struggle or something that we have to figure out because, you know, we're born these little (laughs) blobs, right? That have to be taken care of. I say that affectionately. I absolutely adore newborns. And and then there's like gradual stages. And, you know, I know with my kids the way they are now, I sort of never fronted being (laughs) perfect with my kids. Um, Mm -hmm. So they they know that pretty well. But even even now, sometimes it's, you know, wow, mom, like, (laughs) I'm like, that's right, kid. Like, I'm I'm just doing the best I can over here. Right. But I, I do think that that's like what part of what you were expressing just is a really human story. Yeah. And it's such a gift that you offer that to your kids because they they model that to their friends and to their friends' parents and know that it's okay to just have the full human experience. It's a real gift that you're giving them. Mm. Thanks. It's your trying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We need to wrap up, but I want to share two wins that I had that I'm so stinking proud of. <laughs> yes. Let's hear them. So it's kayaking. So if the kayak stuff doesn't do it for you, then this is a time to tune off and go do something else. But every Saturday in the summer, we do skills practice. And last year, I worked so hard to try and do a self-rescue where you need to hop up on the back of your kayak. You kind of pull yourself up. And then once you get on the back, you've got to pull yourself enough over the back of the kayak so you can pull your body around to get back in the cockpit. I struggled so much last summer and just to try it once a few times is exhausting. It, it doesn't look like skills that it takes a lot, but I've been talking to my paddle partner who is amazing and is light years ahead of me. And she talks about how hard it is, which just makes me feel validated. So the week before I practiced using a paddle float on the end of my paddle, so it acts like a pontoon and was able to do a heel hook and get in a couple of times. So last week, it's like, all right, this is where the proof is in the pudding without using anything. Because what happens is you pull up on the boat and if you don't get yourself over, you either slip back in the water or if you overcorrect, you fall over the other side of the boat. (laughs) 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 And so I tried it on Saturday and I popped up on the boat and I pulled myself up and I flipped around and got in my kayak and I was kind of shocked. And I did it a second time. And then later in the morning, I asked somebody to record me doing it. So I did it and he didn't get the video going. So I had to do it again. And it was so easy. And I think because of the water fitness that I've been doing, the paddling that I've been doing, I've just gotten stronger and more confident and more competent. It just was so exhilarating because I really, really struggled last summer and just wasn't able to do it. Mm -hmm. And then on Monday, my paddle partner suggested that we go out to La Jolla Shores to the beach that the waves were, I think, one to two feet. So we're talking baby waves to practice paddling out and coming back in in the surf. And I don't have a lot of experience. I've only done it twice. And the second time I did it was last year in in Sonata and I dumped out on my boat coming in. And part of what has been challenging for me around skills practice is I don't like wet exits out of my boat. You have your spray skirt. You've got to pull it off when you get out. And I think my perfectionism says like, if you do it right, you don't have to fall out of your boat. And what that does is I'm not willing to do very many things that challenge me because I don't want to fall out of my boat. It doesn't make sense. This is just how I am. And if you're going to be practicing coming in and out of the surf, you're going to get dumped out of your boat. And it was so interesting because I came in a couple of times, got dumped out of my boat didn't get water up my nose, didn't swallow any water. It was fine. And then we're kind of back out waiting for the waves to come in to ride them. And I found myself feeling really anxious. And again, it was that young part. And so I'm like, what's going on? Like, I don't want to fall out on my boat. How come? Because I'm going to swallow water. I'm going to get, it's like, well, we've done that a couple of times and it hasn't happened. I know, but I don't like this. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
And I went through this. I mean, you, you heard me talk about this previously, how anxious I would get going out the channel, going out in the ocean and how difficult it was for me and how many times I had to do it over and over and over. And all I could do was be really present with that part and kind of try and reassure her. And we did a little bit more. And if you go on social media, I, I did post it and I just am sending out. Well, by the time you hear this, if you're subscribed to the newsletter, you got a clip of it's a brief clip of me dumping in my boat. <laughs> but the thing that was interesting is by the time we were done, I was so elated. It's mm -hmm. like this was fun. It was exciting. That's not usually my initial response. If we did this again, it's very likely that I will go through the same process mm -hmm. all over where I get afraid. I don't like it. I want to stop. And I know to just stick with it. And then at the end, I'm like, this was fun. <laughs> And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is what are the things in your life that you want to do that you feel afraid of, that feel intimidating? And I'm not asking you to push beyond what feels comfortable, but I just know for me that every time I push just a little bit and expand, it's like when I made the decision to fly out and see you, look, now I have a trip to kayak next month and I'm going to come back and see you in October and I'm doing another kayak trip and camping in October, <laughs> that it opened the door and now I remember that I want to do things and I like it and COVID made my life so small mm -hmm. that I just stopped doing things and it felt comfortable, but I was really understimulated and I've been feeling so energized and connected and alive and it's like this whole world open and I think this is a challenge that when we are fearful and anxious and our minds take us to the worst possible thought and we think about getting dysregulated, we don't know how to take little baby steps to really live full fulfilling, satisfying lives. Yes. that's. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I mean, this is the part where you just inspire me so much. Hmm. I'm still in that spot of, I mean, I remember I was walking out with Liv just a couple of days ago and I'm like, oof, like I'm still feeling pandemic -ish, ish, yeah. you know, and have not quite broken out that sensation that you're describing right there and going back and doing things and watching your journey with kayaking is is really a metaphor for a life here, right? And and taking the risks and seeing what being curious enough to see what happens, even if you've got this like doubtful part or frightened part. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yay you. <laughs> this is thank you. <laughs> this is so cool. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that reflection because I forget that a couple of years ago, if if you're a friend of mine on Facebook, I would post like just getting dressed in my yoga clothes and not going count is doing anything because I get dressed and I couldn't go. And I, I just could not get myself. I couldn't find an activity to do. And it's interesting that personally, I much prefer to be one-on-one -on -one with people. But when it comes to activities, well, I still prefer one-on-one. -on -one. And groups really help me. And having this Aquafit group and these women are just amazing. And even just after doing the kayak surfing on Monday, on Tuesday, I just felt like I was slow in the morning and I didn't want to go. I think I even texted you, Jen, and like, I know I feel better, but I'm just tired. I want an easy morning. And this is what I tell myself every single time I don't want to go. Just go and get in the pool. You don't have to do anything. Just go and it'll feel good to just move yeah. your body. And I get there. And then all of a sudden, I'm motivated to have a good workout. Yeah. Where I really do have this lifestyle now where I do Aquafit twice a week. I paddle between two and four times a week. It's just a natural part of my life. And I forget that for years, I struggled to just get out the door and walk. That's it right. was really, really hard. <laughs> Hello, I, I get it. <laughs> oh, so I get it. So you and I talked about, you know, you have a treadmill, maybe you can listen to a book on Audible. And that's the time when you exercise, yeah. when you move your body is you have a favorite book and the only time you listen is when you're moving your body or you check your emails when you're on your treadmill or you buddy up with a friend that whatever it is and making goals really, really attainable. Yeah. Walk to the corner. Yeah. Some, uh, I'll get some wind horse at some point. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. To look. But you know what you say about motivation, I think is really important too, because often like the motivation comes after you've shown up. Mm -hmm. And we're not necessarily motivated yeah. prior to that for all, all kinds of like very, I think, physical reasons, biological reasons, right? We're sort of built to conserve energy, but our our system is assuming we need to outrun something. <laughs> That's just not yeah. a part of modern life. I joke, I only run if people are, you know, if someone's chasing me, I need to find someone that's going to just chase me down. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Hmm. Well, and then not let the thoughts for, for me personally, having a plan and a commitment with someone else is really what works for me. Yeah. Because if I went on my feelings, I would say probably 30 to 50% at least of the time when I have an activity scheduled, I, if it were up to me to not do it, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. And if I didn't have a plan, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. And just because I'm very commitment oriented, that's how I'm wired. That really helps me. And then lowering the bar of I can just go and I don't have to do anything. Yeah. Or if I get there and I don't want to, I can turn around and come home. That permission yeah. gives me the ability to go and, and know that I don't have to stay so that the bar is really low and I can't fail. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my friend, anything else before we wrap up? I don't think so, my dear. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Love and appreciate you. Love you too. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Hey again. Did any of that resonate for you? I can't imagine that some of that wasn't relatable because these are just human things that we all experience. And I think the more we get comfy with talking about them and expressing them and finding safe people that we can process this stuff with, the more healing we do. And there really is so much freedom in knowing that it's okay for me to make the choices that I do and not everybody's going to be on board and that's okay. I don't know. I just find it really empowering. If any of this resonates for you and you want to work with Jen, you can reach out to her at jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. If you want to work with me, I love sending you to my website, unapologeticallysensitive.com. I have a contact sheet that just helps me have the information that makes it helpful for me to know how and when to reach you and what works for you. If you're struggling with any of this stuff, if you struggle in relationships and friendships and work, how do you show up? Are you okay with your sensitivity? Are you okay with the wounded parts that come up, the young parts, maybe having emotional outbursts or feeling like people don't care. I don't know if this just stuff shows up all over the place. We would love to be here to support you and help you thrive as a sensitive and a neurodivergent individual. I was redoing some of my links for social media today and I I came up with this new thing. I'm curious to know what you think. How does this sound? Sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's how you're wired because it is. It's just how we're wired. But I did have somebody give me feedback that they like the new way that I'm doing these endings. So I am going to give you the traditional new ending, which is sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's okay for you to be all of you. It's okay to feel like you're too much. It's okay for you to feel like you're not enough. It's okay for you to feel like you're needy. It's okay to have all of your feelings. If you're sad, lonely, tired, irritable, grumpy, joyful, happy, stimmy, as in stimming, all of those parts are okay. It's okay for you to take up space. It's okay for you to say no. It's okay for you to have limits. It's okay to choose what works for you, even if that doesn't work for other people. It's okay for people to not understand you, to not like you, to not appreciate you. It's okay for you to not like other people, to understand them or to appreciate them. We don't have to be everything to everybody. What it really comes down to is us feeling okay about who we are and what we want and how we choose to show up in the world. I'm not advocating being unkind intentionally to anybody. I'm just saying that it's okay for you to be you. And if that rubs somebody the wrong way, that's not really about you. And at the end of the day, I want to be okay with who I am and knowing that not everybody understands and gets me, appreciates me. And some people probably have a very limited view of me or a very specific perspective that it's true. And I don't have to be everything to everybody. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you're doing well. As we're inching our way into fall, my guess is it's still pretty warm wherever you're at. I'm looking forward to having hoodies and hot chocolate as we head into our fall weather. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for being a listener. I deeply appreciate you, each and every one of you. Have a blessed day.